Well, welcome everybody to the Czech Blanc and welcome back Warren Williams, our good friend Warren Williams. I'm so happy to <laughs> have you back on the Czech Blog. This is wonderful. I'm super excited. We got a great topic today. Um, if you don't know Warren Williams, uh, I can't say enough about Warren. He is now Czech faculty. We're excited to have him amongst our Czech faculty. He's the founder and owner of Warren Williams Coaching. Um, and I could just spend, I don't know how long talking about uh, Warren's achievements, but um, We'll just say he he's fantastic. And Yay! <laughs> I'll give you the ten. I'll give you the ten dollars after we finish the, the video. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just ten. Um, <laughs> yeah, the rate's gone down. That's that's right. Um, and and we've got. Um, I, I love talking to Warren because you you always have such interesting topics and interesting perspectives for us. And so today, um, in this video, you're going to be talking about. The habit then is fixed yet needs changing. When we were talking about this uh, this topic offline, uh, if you don't know Warren, he's a huge uh, Bruce Lee fan. And I thought, okay, this is a Bruce Lee. This is like a Bruce Lee saying, but this is a Warren Williams original, actually. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, changing habits today. Yeah. So, um, as you know, jumping right into it. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously we have this, you know, these sayings like um, habit reforms nature. And it's not even that it, it reforms nature, it becomes nature. It becomes the nature of a person to react to a specific habit. So, you know, our good good friend Paul Check, you know, always talks about how um, when a child gets to puberty, by that stage, it's very hard to change them because they've already got, a, they've already created a template of the way they react to things. So, you know, one of the things I always say when it comes to reactions, when it comes to habits is, um, I think I might have said this in some of the other talks, you know, nobody's reacting to an event in their life. They're only reacting to a personalized program mm -hmm. created through repetition. So if some, you know, if a child watches their parents go hysterical, over something that might be minuscule, like this rain, you know, it's rain, oh my gosh, it's rain! <laughs> the child starts to mimic that action or reaction, and then that becomes a habit created through repetition. So the, the child, their personal programming becomes that of their, of their parents, and that's where we talk about this parental modeling. Mm. So this parental modeling creates some of the habits that are reactionary in children as they grow up and then also become adults. So they have these fixed habits or mental patterns that are created or generated through repetition and through modeling. Mm. A lot of these habits don't serve them because the way they react to things is always more than it should be you know like the way people react to any event generally in the western world is far more hyperbole than it needs to be so a lot of those habits need to be changed so um you know when people look at their habits they think that their habits are them mm -hmm. and you know people think that um when you try to change their habits you're actually trying to change the person and you're not. You're just trying to change the things that they do. Mm. And I always say to people, you know, the reason why people resist being changed is because they think you are changing the concept of who they are. Mm. And you're not. You're only changing what they do. Mm. Because who they are, the essence of them, would change in the way they react based on where they were born in the world. So if you grew up in Thailand and you grew up in a monastery, the way you'd react, you'd probably be a lot calmer, speak more quietly, mm. you know, your reactions would be different, but you'd mm. still be the same person mm. versus if you were born in New York yeah, and you were right. in you know, right. a very violent upbringing, your reactions would be different, but it doesn't mean you are different. Mm. It just means how you express, how you walk, your habits of nature are different. And that's what we talk about nature versus nurture. Mm. So the nature of you or the innate person that you are can be nurtured mm. by the circumstance and the situations or places that you are in. Mm. So that's the first thing is to kind of establish is that mm. you are not your habits. Mm. Your habits are simply reactions of a state of consequence or circumstance. Mm. Mm -hmm. Once people kind of understand that, then they kind of understand that they can change their habits to more, as we should we say, like more beneficial habits that serve them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the habits that we have are addictions because we do them all the time. We're addicted to these habits. And that's why 
you know, people don't want to change them because they're addicted to the way they do things, even yeah. though a lot of those things are not serving them. Right. Such as road rage. You know, mm-hmm. you drive a car and every single time someone cuts you up in traffic or, mm-hmm. you know, you stop sharply because someone's driving slowly. It's a habit that you react to as to how you react to the incident. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those habits don't serve you because you get out of your car, you may shout at someone, you might get shot. It's not a habit that serves you. So what we're talking about is the habits that don't serve you. Not the habits that are great, but the habits that don't serve you. And then we look at the term of addiction again, relating this to habits. We know that, um, you know, the term, and, you know, I learned this from Paul, when he said um, addiction, by definition, is any repeated habit that doesn't bring about a favorable result. Mm -hmm. So people are addicted to a habit such as smoking. Mm -hmm. That isn't serving them, but they keep doing it and by definition you cannot be addicted to something that's good because if it was good and you and this is again perception right I, you know so by definition you cannot be addicted to that something that you think is good so i'll correct it as that something that you think is good because if you think it's good you are not compelled to do it you like doing it right so right. if you're addicted to something you don't like doing and you can't help yourself that by definition is an addiction yeah. So when we talk about the habit that needs to be changed, what we're talking about is negative actions or reactions mm-hmm. that are habits formed through nature of circumstance and doing things over, over and over and over again as repetition. Yeah. And that's the kind of ethos of, you know, what I'm trying to um, you know, convey today. Right. So if somebody um, starts martial arts, you know, we love talking about martial arts and stuff. <laughs> right. Somebody starts martial arts and on day one, they're not a martial artist yet and they start classes, maybe in five years' time, they have become a martial artist. They've become a martial artist through the habit of doing martial arts. Mm. So the habit changes their character and the way that they react and do things as a martial artist. Mm. But the essence of them still hasn't changed. Suppose that same person from day one started swimming. Mm. Would they now be a different person because now they're a swimmer? No, they would be the exact same person. So my point here is to get people to understand that by changing your habits doesn't change you as a person Mm -hmm. because that's where the resistance comes to when it comes to change. Mm -hmm. It's getting to understand that first of all. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask is it is, is fear of change, fear of changing. Yeah. Is that their essence? They're who they are. Yeah. 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 And it's not, it's just changing how they do things Mm -hmm. because that's the first major step to getting people to stop smoking or stop drinking alcohol Mm. or start eating organic is Mm. questioning their psyche's idea of the concept of who they are Mm -hmm. and again who they are is attached to what they do Mm. and i think that's such an important point and so i'll say it again who they are is attached to what they do and that's Mm. what they think whatever i do is who i am and Mm. that's the habit that needs to be changed Mm. so when we look at the model of change, we look at these six stages of action. Mm. So the six stages of action when it, when it comes to a habit or forming a habit or breaking a habit are these, the six stages. So the first one is pre-contemplation. Mm-hmm. So pre-contemplation, and I'll use a smoker to mm-hmm. kind of tie this in. Yeah. So pre-contemplation is somebody who doesn't even think about the consequences of smoking. So they're at a stage of pre, pre mm. before the stage of even contemplating. Mm. Um, and then the next stage after that is contemplation. So that may be they know someone in their family or a friend who may have died from smoking. Mm. So now they're like, hmm. Mm. And the hmm stage is contemplation. Right. So they may be thinking, maybe this smoking thing isn't a good idea after all. <laughs> And now we move to the third stage. The third stage is preparation. So they've contemplated and they've thought about it to the point where they say, you know what, I need to prepare myself to actually do this. So they may go to, you know, some association, Smokers Anonymous, or they may go and get Nicorette patches, or they may look into vaporizing. So they're preparing themselves. And then the fourth stage is action. They do what they've prepared to do. And when they're at the stage of action, they're actually creating a new habit. And because it takes a certain amount of time, 21 days to make, um, they, it takes them a certain amount of time to create this habit that feels natural to them. Mm-hmm. And then once they are, but they're constantly mindful of it. They have mm-hmm. to keep thinking about it every single day because it's new mm-hmm. and it's not a natural habit. Mm-hmm. So they have to keep thinking about it. That's the fourth stage. And the fifth stage is um, 
you know, continuation mm -hmm. or maintenance, some people call it. Mm -hmm. um, and the maintenance stage is you continue doing the habit that you started. Mm. And eventually they get to the point of the sixth stage, which is termination, mm. because they no, no longer need to have it as a conscious thought. It's now mm. subconscious because it's reactionary. Mm. And now you form the new habit. Mm. But that new habit is now positive because of choice. Mm. So we kind of liken it in like a record, the olden day records, where to create a song, you put a groove, you start creating grooves in the, in the record, yeah. and the grooves make enough grooves, it creates a sound, and then enough sounds, it creates a tune, and enough tunes, it creates an actual song. Mm. So it's creating an impression in your mind, so you start making the grooves, and eventually over time, you fill the grooves in, and then it becomes a song that mm. you play. And that's the repetition of the mind, it creates that song that you can play. So, you know, most people, uh, and, you know, again, I learned this from Paul, you know, most people, are, as we know, are in a stage of negative thoughts, but mm -hmm. those negative thoughts are habits. Yeah. It's again, it's a habit that needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason why most people are in negative thoughts, and this is something that, you know, Paul was teaching is because their cells are, they're in a fear stage and their cells are constantly sending fear to their body. And the reason why is because it's trying to get them to become self-aware enough to change. Yeah. So the body sends fear signals, fear signals to them, which are negatives. It's, mm -hmm. you know, fear is a negative thing to force you to become self-aware enough to make a change. So the fear signals are being interpreted by the person, but being ignored. So they stay in a negative state. But mm -hmm. if they become self-aware of those negative fear signals, then it creates an, like, why am I scared? Mm -hmm. What am I scared of? Okay, I'm scared of that. Right, I need to do this to change that. Mm -hmm. but, most, but they don't, so they just stay in that fear stage or stay in that negative mindset. So, you know, in that sense, fear becomes something good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something powerful about fear, which again relates back to habits, is, you know, I heard this about a year ago, where um, you've got two different um, acronyms for fear. Mm -hmm. Forget everything and run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Forget everything and run. Yeah. Or positive face everything and rise yeah, i like that yeah. yeah yeah so the fear signals if they are interpreted correctly it's face everything and rise what's yeah. going on inside me what am i so scared about face it make a better choice a better habit mm. to reform the nature of how i do things or the nature of the beast mm. so negative thoughts create positive actions if interpreted correctly right. so you know people see obstacles in their life as challenges um, that they cannot overcome. But if you see it as an obstacle that teaches you something or a lesson, mm. then a pain teacher comes along right. to educate you as to making a better choice. Right. And, you know, like Paul, Paul says, um, the pain teacher always arrives to show you what you're doing unconsciously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the unconscious things are habits because in order for something to be a habit, you don't have to think about it. It just happens. So it's unconscious. And as Paul says again, if you don't like what's happening in your life, think about what choices you're making unconsciously. Yeah. And again, it's unconscious, so it must be a habit. If it wasn't a habit, it wouldn't be unconscious because you'd have to constantly be thinking about it. Right. But it's just a habit for you to do something. And most of the time, as we know, most people in the Western world are predominantly negative thought related, which is why 90% of their thoughts are negative. So that's why it's the habit that needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. You know, So... And another thing about that is um, self-awareness and self-realization. Mm. So um, whenever people get to the stage of self-awareness of a specific habit that is not serving them or an addiction that is no longer serving them, one of two things happen when it comes to the self-awareness. Mm. They either grow, which means they change in a positive way, or they go into further denial. The only two things can happen. And in order for you to go into further denial, you have to become so much more ignorant in order for you to go further into denial. Mm. It's almost like, you know, when we, we talk to people about nutrition and people talk about oh, organic food, there's no difference, but they've never, ever researched it. Mm. And they are the expert, you know, they're the absolute expert on nutrition, but they've never studied it. And they say, don't be silly. Organic food is far more expensive. There's no difference. And you say, have you done any research? No. Here's some research for you to read. And if they start to read it and it questions their idea of what they think is right, they have to ignore it. Yeah. They've been yeah. faced with the truth and the only way they can stay in their own habit to keep them comfortable is to ignore it. And they have to become so good at ignoring it. Yeah. 
Yeah. So they go yeah. further into denial to deny the truth of what they saw. And, you know, the statement, ignorance. Ignorance means to ignore the fact. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, You're right. ignoring something that you know is true. So, again, it's another mental habit that is no longer serving you. That's why it needs to be changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, gosh, there's a lot going on in there. I, I wonder... Um, you know, we've talked about the six uh, steps for change, right? And, yeah. Um, I, I just, all of this makes sense. I'm wondering, so so I have a habit I want to, suppose I have a habit I want to change, whatever it is, right? Mm. The, it's It seems like the the question then is, you know, I think a lot of people can, once they get past that pre-contemplative stage, right? They know that mm. there's something going on. They know that there's something that's needed to change. But um, change uh, seems like, those old habits have a gravity, right? And as you start to try to wear the grooves and make the new habit, right, that mm. keeping like keeping your foot on the gas pedal becomes harder and harder and harder, right? Mm. Whether it's because um, uh, right you worry that you're changing yourself or your old habits feel comfortable or whatever it is, that it's it's it, it's really hard process regardless of whether it's a you know sort of small habit or a big habit and so so how do you you know sort of coach your clients through that sort of gritting it out right that mm. uh you know i have to you know work on this for weeks at a time to establish it as a habit and while i'm doing that the old habits are kind of yanking on me they are calling to me they're trying to drag me back mm. Mm. yeah um because and with that, when you when you talk to your clients about a lot of their habits, what they do is, um, and it's so funny because so many people try to defend the ideas that created a problem that brought them to see you in the first place. Mm. The only way they can do that is they create this internal dialogue inside themselves. So yeah. when you tell them um, your habit is not serving you, yeah, they say no, and then in their mind they've created a dialogue to defend the idea that created the problem in the first place, and they become so good at it. Mm. So, you know, one of the solutions is, um, you know, look at to look at things. What am I, you know, what am I learning from the habit? How is it serving me? Mm. And that's the first thing. It's like you look at you speak to someone about their habit. And say, okay, right, you eat. Twice as much as you as you as you should. You said that. Okay, how is that? What's that doing for you? And so I what, what I do is I get them to take a journey with the, what we call the crystal ball. Mm. You say the choice that you're making today that you feel is not serving you, that you feel is too hard to change. Give me five years time. What's your life like now? Mm. And so they get to this, the point is you got to get them to the point of self realization where they realize it's their choices that are bringing about a reality. So you say. If you continue to do what you've always done, you continue to get what you've always gotten. Another four mm, checks. Mm -hmm. So if you do this habit that you feel is not serving you, which is why you came to me in the first place, where do you think you'll be in five years' time? Yeah. And then they say, okay, I'll be just the same place. Okay, so now we've gotten to a stage of self-realization. Yeah. So if you feel that, so you've just admitted that you'll be in the same place, and you say to them, okay, is that what you want? Mm. No. Okay, so now you have, so basically what we're doing is we're trying to get them to take ownership Mm. or accountability for their choices first of all because a lot of the times these people they come to you and they want you to fix their problems mm. so they want to blame you and they want to stay the same i want to lose weight but i want to party yeah i want to lose weight but i want to eat un unorganic i want to lose weight but i don't want to exercise yeah. so you give me the solution so you say to them okay drinking how is that serving you so you make them you you get them to take ownership of their problem and once they take ownership they have to get to say self-awareness of their problem in the first place. And then you get people that just wanna argue with you. And then all you have to say is, why are you here? Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, why are you here? You yeah. know, if everything in your life is working for you and the choices that you're making are working for you, why are you here? Yeah. And they can't, they, they can ignore it mm. or they can face it. And the thing is, you know, the ego always wants to save everyone. You know, but we have to just be honest and say some people don't want to be changed. They want their pain and some people get mileage out of their pain. Mm -hmm. So they just come to you to have an excuse to say they tried. Yeah. Yeah. And then they go about their merry way. So we can't change everybody. So, so long as we as coaches understand that we can't change everybody. And so long as we know and we've, we've um, kind of quantified through our questionnaires that on their willingness needle, mm -hmm. they're at a 7 out of 10. 
then we can help change. And if there are seven out of 10, then we can work on the processes of what I'm going to say now, which is first of all, the accountability stuff that we've kind of just mentioned. Mm. The accountability that their choices aren't serving them because they're making those choices. Mm. The next thing is to find out, and this is something that's really important as well, is um, if you're doing things just for yourself, there isn't as much motivation as if you're doing it for something bigger than you. Mm, right. So why do you want to be healthy? You know, why do you want to be fit? Why do you want to be strong? You know, mm. what is that it's preventing you from doing? Mm. It's always bigger than you. So, you know, when Paul says, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. Mm. If the dream is big enough, mm. then the action is easy because, you know, the formula for change is this, um, if the resist if the if the resistance to change is greater mm. then the desire for change and change will happen but if the other way around it mm. will yeah. the desire for change is greater than the resistance to change and yeah. change will happen yeah. and you find that person's desire by finding out their passion mm. finding out what their dream is and once you find out what their dream is you help them to work and a lot of people don't know what their dream is mm. and it's okay if you don't know what your dream is as you know you've gone through this and other people have done this in other blogs is find out what their nightmare is mm. what don't happen in your life yeah. what don't you want to happen with the choices that you're making and the habits that are no longer serving you well i sleep in too late and yeah. what's that doing for you it's making me become unproductive so that's yeah. the nightmare yeah. so how do you change that habit uh, i don't know start waking up early oh my gosh you're so smart but it's making sure yeah. they're saying it first because yeah. if you as folks tell them what they're doing wrong then they become the, ch the child and unresponsible mm. But if you make them become the adult by, mm. you know, saying what's wrong, mm. then it should become more apparent because they're the ones that are actually the final for the information. They're the ones that are the anchor to their truth. Yeah, that's fascinating. So there's two great things going on there. in there. One is, as you said, the idea that if you come to a realization on your own, mm. that's a lot more powerful than having somebody tell you that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing with um, nightmares and dreams, right, is uh, our emotional reactions are often far more compelling than the r rational, mm -hmm. logical side of our mind, right? So mm -hmm. when you ha are able to connect somebody to their nightmare or, mm -hmm. or their dream, you connect to them to some really powerful emotions. And those are, mm -hmm. are really effective and mot motivators, drivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um and, you know, a lot of these people, um, they're on this Groundhog Day. Mm. You know, they mm. repeat the same habits. And um, what I always say to people, you know, this powerful saying that um, life isn't happening for, to you. It's happening for you, mm. you know. And when people understand that, it's, that is such a powerful statement. I didn't make it up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a powerful statement. Yeah. Life is not happening to you. Life is happening for you. Mm. When people understand that, game over is a total shift because when people think life is happening to them they think the universe is attacking them mm. and when something bad is happening in their life like if they created the habit of eating too much food mm. the universe did it to them mm. and then they think yeah woe is me i'm not going to change because it's all been done to me when anything bad happens in my life that's been done to me yeah. and so i can stay in this little shell of woe is me and poor me and in a sympathy stage yeah because that, i'm powerless it, yeah exactly they stay yeah. powerless because of that exactly so if somebody thinks life is happening for me even if it's like bad like you had a car crash you lost your house a loved one passed away you may think well, how is that for me mm. so i know situations and people who um they you know they had they had um a, 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 a lover and and a, a child mm. and the lover that they're, they're, they're secondary um and i don't mean secondaries and lower right. than them i mean second partner mm. you know second person in the relationship mm. they would do most of the housework or maybe looking mainly after the child mm. and that person passes on mm. and then now they're lumped with the responsibility and the circumstance is incredibly painful and bad yeah. but if they switch it and think okay what am i learning from this why is it how is it a process of something's happening for me what it's forced you to do is upgrade mm. and become so much more productive in your life to earn more money, mm. to become more better at time management, mm. be a better father or mother to that child. So that's where it's happening for you. It forces you into a stage of growth. 
that's the part of life happening for you. So mm-hmm. if you're struggling financially and you've never made ends meet and you blame the situation, then you stay powerless, like you said. Mm-hmm. But if you say, what am I doing wrong? How, what am I learning from this lesson? Mm-hmm. Then it's happening for you. And you say, okay, I need to upgrade my software to overcome the circumstances that are happening in my life. Yeah. And when people see that and they realize that life is happening for them and every challenge in their life is to teach them something, mm-hmm. a lesson for them to overgrow and to conquer, then they become better. And then they realize that the habits that were holding them back, that were putting them into financial ruin or putting them into un- unfulfilling relationships and all that sort of stuff that habit needs to change in order for them to be fulfilled and, and grow and to create a habit of success and, you know, happiness and all that sort of stuff in their life. So, you know, once they kind of understand that, that's the paradigm shift mm. to you or for you. Mm. And then they realize that the habits that they are creating that were the two use are no longer serving them and they have to embrace the four use. Yeah. And right, once you've made that fundamental switch, then changing all this, the other habits uh, probably becomes you know, infinitely easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had I've had clients that, um, you know, have gone through great challenges and, um, you know, f- for years or months, whatever, they're, all they're doing is trying to hold on to their pain mm-hmm. because they think it serves them in some way because a lot of these people, as we know, uh, a lot of these people, they come to you and they want to be smothered with love because they've not had it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And that's why they come to you and they love being around you because you're the only person that's paying them attention. Mm. And so they want to stay broken so they can keep this sympathy and attention from you yeah. but we have to teach them to become adults yeah. and you teach them to become adults by accountability and once you once they get past this i just need your help and they get to the stage of you're not broken yeah. um you just need to learn like there was a saying um i think paul check said this as well actually the, the poor don't need help they need leadership mm. Mm. because once they're guided then they create a shift because it goes back to the saying of teach a man or give a man a fish. Mm-hmm. You know, so what we're trying to do as coaches is force them to become accountable to the habits that are holding back so they can make better habits that are improving them or bringing them into a stage of abundance and growth in their lives. Um, the other thing as well is the ego. You know, Most people are so fixated on maintaining the ego that identifies who they are because the, the ego is really, when the ego is formed, it's really you saying I am. Mm-hmm. And when you say I am, you, you, you claim your identity and the habits that you associate with yourself are part of that identity. So again, it's the sphere of I'm losing my ego. So another way that people can kind of forcibly change themselves and let go of a lot of these habits is going on like shamanic journeys. Mm. Because when you're on a lot of shamanic journeys, you face your ego and you face the truth of what you've been hiding from yourself. And when you face the truth, you, can't, you can no longer lie. You come back to this world with a level of clarity that you can you can keep you know lying to yourself, but the ego will force you to see the truth, and that's the you know a lot of the problem with a lot of these religious systems today, where they try to protect you from seeing the actual truth by letting you have a third party relationship with yourself. Mm. When you have a first party relationship and actually go into what the ego is actually telling you, mm. then you face the truth of any situation. And once you kind of can break down the ego and allow the truth to come out, then change happens. So shamanic journeys, when we're talking about the solution stuff, Mm -hmm. is another thing. Um, The more if you go into meditation, Mm -hmm. even if people can't meditate, I always say meditation is the most extreme form of spirituality because it's it's going from never running a marathon to going straight into a marathon. It's very extreme. So I don't get people to go into um, marathons. I don't get people to go into (laughs) meditation straight away. I would say just start doing guided meditations, you know, Mm. down things like Headspace, Mm -hmm. which is which teaches you meditative practices Mm. so that you're having your mind focus on something. But the end goal would be meditation. So if you start with that, you start with Tai Chi, you do Qigong, you do breathing exercises, you do visualization, you do counting, whatever it is that keeps your mind focused. The good thing about that is when you can eventually get to the stage of meditation, you're no longer conquered by the ego. And you can let go of a lot of the attachment because that's the thing. That's a lot, the, a lot of the problem when it comes to changing habits is that there's an attachment syndrome we have with everything that we do. So when people don't want to take a change, a lot of it is because they're attached to every idea of who they think they are, the good and the bad. They attach themselves to it so much that thinking that they're changing is going to hurt their ego. So when you go into a stage of meditation, you detach from the ego and detach, detach from the things that you claim as you, who you are mm. as an identity. Mm. Um, so yeah, journeys, meditation, 
um, guided meditation, Tai Chi, all these sort of things help you to face it. And then the other thing that we said is finding your dream. Um, mindfulness, all the sort of things that raise your consciousness to a state of awareness. These are the things that help you to change. Yeah. And imagine just sort of training yourself to when you have something that feels like it's triggering you or when you realize you sort of were caught up in your habit, just training yourself to take a breath, step back and say, well, what can I learn from this? Mm. Right? Um, yeah. Might be an, a useful habit to develop. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like I said, a lot of people are so unconscious of the things that they do. It's crazy. Like, you know, sometimes we work with, when I work with some clients and you get them to write down the food that they're eating, mm. when they write it down, they come back to you and they say, oh my gosh, I did not realize I ate that. <laughs> sometimes they don't even know they're buying certain things. Like, they, they also, I didn't realize I, I ate chocolate bars called such and such. Because mm. they just walk in the shop and I'm going to the seventh aisle, yeah. pick it up. Yeah. I'm going to the ninth aisle, pick it up. Yeah. And they don't realize. And sometimes when you get them to write it down, they say, oh, my gosh, I ate seven packets of crisps a day. Mm-hmm. They didn't even realize they did it. Like I had a client who was, um, she was 22 stone. And in six months, we got her without any cardiovascular exercise, aerobic <laughs> cardiovascular exercise at all. Mm-hmm. Um, we got her down to 14 stone in six months. Wow. And so- it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. When I got her to do her food diary, she came back to me and she was eating 10 packs of crisps a day, but she didn't know Wow! because it was unconscious habits. Yeah. And again, it's going back to that key word, habits yeah. that aren't serving you. So most people are so unconscious with the things that they do every single day that they are unproductive because they are unconscious of it. So the most successful people in the world are the ones that are so conscious of every choice which is why a lot of these people say when you wake up in the morning make a to-do list because a to-do list brings it from the subconscious into the conscious mind to the stage of self-awareness because you are you have to be aware to make up to write notes you know yeah, right and that's what that's what it, that's what change that's what change happens is self-awareness so if you make um mindfulness notes every single day journaling every single day to do lists every single day the dream charts that we use in the check system mm-hmm. uh, the four doctor system um you know um all these sort of things that you write down engage your mind even the coin journal that we you know we obviously you've spoken about in loads of other of the check blogs doing the, the coin drill, the mind flip drill, Paul calls it, bringing thought into reality to create a physical action of negative to positive thoughts and challenges. All of those sort of things will create change if people are ready, but it only has to be if they're ready to change. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a lot. That's fantastic, though. I mean, I, um, you know, as we know in, in the Czech system, that you know, there's this understanding that uh, those sorts of internal change well changes talking about change right uh are are really crucial to long term uh really achieving your your goals in the long term and and that's what everybody really wants right because it's like weight loss right this whole yo-yo that people go on right it's because i think a lot of times there hasn't been that internal grappling with with change and accepting change Mm. yeah and that's the thing people think that um you know, I always say people think that we're evolving because we've got iPhones now, but we're de-evolving <laughs> because, you know, we're, we're unconscious now, yeah. you know, but, you know, if you give an animal, like if you give a cow um, chicken, it won't eat it because it's consciously making the choice to eat grass. Mm. But, you know, you give people food, sometimes they just unconsciously eat in the food and sometimes you see people just go in, go into the refrigerator, opening the door, just pulling something out and unconsciously doing it. So like you said, if people can just get to the stage of, being conscious of everything that they think mm. change will happen yeah. and they, they will no longer have a negative habit yeah becoming conscious yeah. yeah well great that was fantastic warren um i'm so glad you you're you joined us again and, and i'm back together. yes you're back and so this was this was fantastic um and a lot a lot to to work through here and we'll put the um audio recording down below uh, so that people can take you with them and listen to to you on their way to work or listen whatever. Listen to me on the go. That's right, Warren on the go. Um, and I invite everybody to do so because uh, if you listened all the way through, then you know, this is wonderful stuff. So thanks so much, Warren. Thanks for having me once again. I'm so glad to be back in the presence of James. <laughs> wow.
<laughs> I'm blushing. Well, um, we're gonna do um, <laughs> we're gonna do another uh, video here soon too, where, where we'll talk about success versus fulfillment, and uh, uh, I think uh, this is another really important topic, and uh, folks are gonna get a lot of, a lot out of this one too. Thanks, a lot, guys. Yes, good. All right. Well, uh, we'll talk again soon, Warren. Thank you.